Have you heard the story of the hen and the pig? Well, these two friends were walking down the street one day, and they happened to pass by a church with a sign out front that said, Help the Needy. And they began talking and discussing how they could possibly help those in need. As you might imagine, the two farm animals didn't have very much to offer in the way of clothing or money or things like that. Although, if you've read the, uh, the classic animal farm, you may be imagining a situation in which animals could become very wealthy. But as they were talking, Hen finally got what he thought was a great idea. I know how we could help, Hen said. We could give them ham and eggs for breakfast. The pig was horrified. That's okay for you, he said. For you, it's just a contribution. For me, that's a total commitment. Commitment to the right things and the right people is a virtue, but it might be a virtue that's slowly disappearing from our society. It seems like the only form of commitment really being upheld in society today is a deep commitment to oneself. Often we go through the acts of commitment, but we're not committed. We want the benefits, but no responsibility. And sometimes the first little wind and storm or problem we encounter, we give up. It feels like customer service representatives are no longer committed to making the consumer experience pleasant. They see you coming and they try to avoid you at all costs. Of course, some of that has to do with the type of consumers we've become too. It seems like we're often not committed to our jobs or our colleagues. The first sign of criticism, we quit. In our churches, we encounter conflict and it's either fight or flight because we're not committed to working through the issues and finding peace. It's so easy to forsake responsibility and walk away because commitment is hard. Commitment means dedication and devotion. It even involves the change of will and opinions. Commitment fails because of the lack of responsibility to a relationship. We all know that relationships require give and take. Commitment means two people willing to make concessions and compromises in order to have a balanced relationship. Give and take is an attitude and an approach to creating and maintaining a healthy relationship. But perhaps our lack of commitment to relationships has a direct correlation to our lack of commitment to the high and holy things of God. I wonder how far Christians have strayed from the path of total commitment to Jesus. Somewhere along the cultural and societal shifts, it seems that we've minimized Jesus' call to total abandonment. Churches are full of people who are content with a casual relationship without considering what a deep relationship with Christ entails. One writer stated it this way, we are afraid that if we ask too much, people will stop coming to our churches. Our operating assumption is that people will flee to the nearby entertainment church if we ask them to give too much of themselves. So we start with a low bar and try to entice people by increments of commitment, hoping that we can raise the bar imperceptibly to the ultimate destination of discipleship. Discipleship is much more than church membership, showing up for services, joining a committee, or even backing a building project. As we discussed last week, authentic discipleship requires examining our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Our Christianity is not what we do, it's why we do it. Regular church attendance supporting the church yard sale or singing in the choir makes discipleship an activity rather than an identity. In today's passage of scripture, Jesus had several encounters with different people, and each response to Jesus was different. How many of us will follow when we feel like God's getting a little too close, when God's demanding too much, when God's all up in our business? Some will say, I don't want a God like that in my life. I just need a God who will give me fire insurance when I need it most. Many will claim to follow Jesus, but what they really are are fans of Jesus. They like the idea of Jesus. They'll cheer him on like the triumphal ent entry. Uh, fans will holler, Jesus! Woo! But true followers develop a relationship with him. The first interaction we see in this passage is between Jesus and Peter's sick mother-in-law. Interesting that Peter didn't say anything to Jesus about his mother-in-law being sick or ask Jesus to heal her. I wonder if that tells us something about the son-in-law, mother-in-law relationship there. You know those in-law relationships can be tough. 
But Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law, and she immediately gave a natural and joyful response to the compassionate and healing touch of Jesus. She took the strength and energy that Jesus freely and lovingly restored to her, and she immediately began to use it in his service. Her commitment did not waver. She didn't look back. Something about this man made her want to follow and give her all to him. No questions to ask, no negotiation or ultimatums to make. By faith, she served Jesus. Next, we see an interaction with two would-be disciples. Let's look at the first one who's identified as a teacher of the religious law. He would have been knowledgeable and well-respected in the religious community, and he probably figured that Jesus could use a guy like him. Remember, Jesus' apostles were a motley crew of fishermen and tax collectors and insurrectionists. Not exactly the most well-respected and educated bunch of guys. This guy thought he was doing Jesus a favor, instead of seeing that he actually owed his very life to Jesus. Instead of seeing that he owed his allegiance to Jesus as Master and Lord. He was a fan of Jesus. This scribe believed that Jesus would accept whoever signed up. See, he was offering to sign up instead of responding to a sovereign call of Jesus upon his life. The Lord could see his heart, and he could see that he was not actually committed to following Jesus. Jesus tells this man that while animals have homes, Jesus, and by extension his followers, would experience continual rejection and homelessness. Now, it's not the case that Jesus literally never had a place to lay his head, nor is it the case that the disciples of Jesus may not have a home. C.A. Evans noted, there's nothing wrong with having a house or a bed. What Jesus is teaching, however, is that if these things mean too much to a person, then that person will find discipleship too demanding. So this isn't a prohibition against owning property, but rather an admonition against letting material comforts or lack thereof distract from discipleship. Jesus told this first would-be disciple that periods of homelessness were an ever-present responsibility, uh, an ever-present possibility, I'm sorry, for Christ and his followers. Jesus made it clear that following him held no promise of anything beneficial at least in the worldly sense. He had no temporal wealth to offer because he himself lived in poverty. Theologian Philip Ryken noted that for contemporary followers of Jesus, this means laying aside our earthly ambitions. It means letting go of creature comforts to make costly gifts to Christian ministry. For some, it will mean giving up the security of our homes to follow God's calling. The first would-be disciple was seemingly turned back by the warning that there would be times when he would struggle to have his basic physical needs met. This would-be disciple wasn't willing to subordinate his physical needs to the mission. Being willing to sacrifice one's own comfort when necessary is a requirement for being a disciple of Jesus Christ. This religious leader gravitated towards, gravitated toward Jesus for popularity. But when the rubber met the road and things got tough, he would have to suffer hardship and ridicule and persecution. And Jesus knew that he would immediately fall away. Making a commitment to be a disciple isn't conditional. It's a wholehearted response to God's call to us. You can't play around with this thing. The second would-be disciple wanted to take care of burying his father first before following Christ. And Jesus says, you're not really committed to the kingdom. Now, wanting to bury one's father was not a trivial excuse because it's the fulfillment of the obligation to honor father and mother. Proper burial, especially of one's parents, was a mandated responsibility within the Jewish culture in the first century Mediterranean. This was such an important task for the son to accomplish that one theologian said that it was the best possible excuse for delaying discipleship. Not giving individuals a proper burial was a demonstration of dishonor, and failing to give a father a proper burial brought shame on the entire family. 
when it comes to a task that is this important familially and culturally, it's almost inconceivable that anyone who understood the culture would ask an individual to abandon that responsibility in order to do something else. Yet that's exactly what Jesus did with this second would-be disciple. The fact that Jesus was willing to elevate the work of the kingdom of God above the most sacred familial and cultural responsibilities demonstrates how important Jesus believed his work to be. By telling the would-be disciple to let someone else bury his father, Jesus was asking him to willingly face and expose his family to the inevitable disgrace of failing to honor his father with a proper burial. In his book entitled Radical, which discusses the nature of Christian discipleship, David Platt described the interaction between Jesus and these would-be followers this way. Become homeless. Let someone else bury your dad. Jesus was not using a gimmick to get more followers. He was simply and boldly making it clear from the start that if you follow him, you abandon everything. Your needs, your desires, and even your family. Now, this may sound unnecessarily harsh on Jesus' behalf, right? I mean, the guy just wants to go and give his dad a proper funeral. But there are two major things that we need to understand about the context of this story. Many scholars have argued that it's probable that the man's father was not even dead yet. If this is the case, the individual was not asking to go and take care of the funeral burial quickly and then return, but rather wait for the remainder of his father's life so that he could then fulfill his responsibility. The second factor is a practice known as the secondary burial. And secondary burial refers to the practice of reburying the bones of the dead after the flesh of the body has decomposed. This burial custom, which happens in many cultures, had a long history among the Jews even before the first century CE. And this period between the first and second burial was approximately a period of 12 months. Whereas mourning traditionally lasted 30 days in the Jewish tradition, in the case of a parent, the 12 months between the first and second burial was a period of extended mourning. So adding this 12-month mourning period between the first and second burials to the fact that the would-be disciple's father probably wasn't even dead yet, the request was not for a brief delay in beginning his discipleship, but rather a delay that could last for years. There can only be one master, and his name is Jesus. You have to follow Jesus through the hardships, leave everything, embrace the cross, and do as the Holy Spirit leads, even though you'll never be recognized for it. The final interaction that we see is between Jesus and his disciples on the boat. They get in the boat to cross the lake, and Jesus immediately falls asleep. This lake is notorious for sudden, violent squalls. And that Jesus was nonetheless asleep, even on a voyage, which would normally only take an hour or two, certainly indicates that he was exhausted by his constant activity. And that <laughs> contrasts with the disciples' anxiety, which underlines Jesus' control of the situation. When this huge storm hits, the disciples lose their ever-loving minds, and they wake Jesus up and they scream, Don't you care that we're about to drown? Save us! What I think is particularly fascinating here is the fact that Jesus rebukes the disciples before he rebukes the storm. They wake him up, and before he performs this miraculous act of commanding the storm to cease, he's asking the disciples why they have so little faith. The storm is still pounding them, the ship is still shaking, the waves are still crashing, and rather than taking action and then teaching his disciples, Jesus chooses to discuss their faith with them prior to calming the storm. I imagine that this probably didn't help to calm the disciples' nerves at all. But Jesus rebukes the storm, he tells the waves to be still, and he rescues the men and the boat from certain destruction. After which the men say, Wow, who is this guy that even the weather listens to what he says? The disciples got into the boat with Jesus. They had heard his convincing sermons and witnessed his miracles. And yet, in this moment, they were afraid. They were so fortunate to live with Jesus, to eat with him, to sleep in the same room, to look in his face, to be able to touch his hand. 
and these 12 men who we all envy because of their experience with Jesus, they were lacking in faith and commitment. How much more for us? Jesus wants us to come to a place in our lives where we put our trust and confidence in him in all situations. When the sea is calm, when the weather is nice, we tend to trust our resources and ourselves. When those things are threatened, we run to Jesus and we ask him if he cares. Don't you care? Just like the disciples, they followed Jesus, but they struggled with total commitment. Now, we're probably not going to become perfectly and totally committed on this side of the new heaven and the new earth. But that doesn't mean that it shouldn't be our goal. Just like the would-be disciples, contemporary followers of Christ are so often distracted and pulled away by commitment to things other than Christ. Wealth, power, nationalism, charismatic leaders, political ideologies, pride and selfishness, machismo. These are just some of the things that we pledge allegiance to other than Christ. And just like the would-be disciples, <clears throat> excuse me, if we are not going to be totally committed to following Jesus and building the kingdom of God, then we're probably not following Jesus the way that we should be. Now, you might ask what commitment looks like. Alex, you keep saying that coming to church and giving an offering are not true discipleship. Please tell me, what does commitment to Christ look like? Give me some tangibles. Make it plain. Well, I'm so glad you asked. Friends, discipleship goes beyond our obedience. Commitment to being obedient is important, but that's not the fullness of discipleship. Discipleship is more demanding. It requires constant examination and re-examination of our actions and our motives. Moreover, while we're examining our ways, we never think about breaking our commitment to Jesus. So here are some things that help with our commitment to Jesus. We must consistently respond to Jesus with yes. Jesus says, love your neighbor, feed the poor, care for the sick, welcome the stranger and visit the prisoner. Are we responding with yes? Or do we ignore our neighbor, blame the poor for their plight, tell the sick they should have gotten better insurance and argue that convicts deserve what they get? Every day we must encounter Christ anew. Every day we live into a newness of life. Every day we die to our old selves. We must seek Christ in new ways with eyes to see and ears to hear, asking God to reveal God's self more deeply and fully to us. Do we seek to know God more and more? Or do we think that we've got it all together and think that we already know everything there is to know? We need to be reading and praying with scripture, both alone and in community. If we're not regularly engaging the words that God has used to reveal God's self and his son to us, how committed can we really be? It's about ordering our lives around the gospel of Jesus Christ. Biblical illiteracy is a huge problem in contemporary churches. Many people just accept whatever the pastor says without thinking twice about it. Friends, don't just accept what I say. Read scripture for yourselves. Study it. Pray over it. We need to meditate and praise as a response for God's love. Whether this is through prayer or singing or writing letters to God or making art or creating poetry, we should never let the love of God be too far from our hearts and minds. And we should express our thankfulness for that love. We need to allow the message of Christ to come alive within us so that we, we can reach those around us, encouraging and helping others, always seeking to do good. Does this describe our actions? Do people see a hope within us that's not present in those who are not followers of Christ? Finally, we need to love others. Loving God and loving others is the passion behind discipleship. This is what discipleship really boils down to. Throughout this series, we've talked about the demands that John the Baptist made of those who were going to be baptized, how to stand up to temptation, the types of actions and attitudes which are blessed by God, and how to be authentic in our faith activities. All of this plays into our total commitment. 
And we cannot be afraid of commitment if we're going to be true followers of Christ. Friends, Christ is calling you to follow him. Make a commitment. Commit to attending Bible study, to fasting, reflecting, to praying, to worshiping. Commit to reaching out to all people, especially to those in need. Commit to sharing the love of God with all people without any exceptions because God loves humanity and our commitment to Christ is demonstrated when we love those whom everyone else tells you're not welcome here. Friends, the world needs us to be totally committed to following Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus has extended the call of discipleship to us. Forgive us for the times when we've tried to get by with less than total commitment. When the changing winds of our nation or our society has caused us to follow after something other than you. Strengthen us through the power of the Holy Spirit to commit ourselves to you in our words, thoughts, and actions on a daily basis so that we can be fully committed to you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen.